Hello and welcome to Uz Report World News with me, Sayyid Rasul Ashraf Khanav. In our latest stories, no more state orders for cotton crops. Illegal tree cutting draws the president's attention. And three deals with aqua power for a total of $2 billion. The president of Uzbekistan has signed a historic and long-awaited decree providing for the abolition of the state order system for cotton crops. This document set to end a decades-long arrangement that encouraged forced labor. My colleague has more. Under the presidential decree signed on March 6, the government will from 2020 cancel quotas for the production and sale of cotton, leaving farmers who rent land from the state free to cultivate alternative and more lucrative crops. The same reform will see the state set quota for grain reduced by 25%. This marks a decisive development in Uzbekistan's stated ambition to nudge its agriculture sector, which is one of the country's main sources of employment, toward more market-based rules. In January, Mirziyayev approved a decree envisioning a gradual reduction in the volume of grain that the state purchases through its state order system starting from 2021. Even as the government withdraws from these key areas of economy, it has pledged to retain a key role in the agriculture, at least to ensure that grain prices remain stable and so staple food supplies are not interrupted. Jonas Astrup, Tashkent-based technical advisor for the International Labour Organization, hailed the scrapping of the cotton quota, which he described as a historic development. This thread provides key points of the new decree which will directly impact the 2020 production and harvest, he wrote on his Twitter. Part of the intent behind moving away from the mass output of raw cotton is also to improve Uzbekistan's international image. The quotas and the strict regime under which they were enforced have over the decades served as irresistible contributing factors toward the perpetuation of a system of forced labor that saw students and government workers marshaled into doing harvesting work for little. The reform is set to make the raw cotton price free and the state-owned Pahta Sanawad will be liquidated. Moreover, the farmers from now on will be able to enjoy economic effect of cotton growing. The situation around illegal cutting of trees in Uzbekistan has come under harsh criticism by residents of the country and activists. Numerous conflicts between residents and developers has drawn the attention of the head of state. To take the situation under control, President Shavkat Mirziyoyev chaired a meeting devoted to the system of environmental protection and waste management. President Mirziyoyev said that he is dissatisfied with the implementation of environmental protection concept and the solid waste management strategy. He pointed to the need to ensure full coverage of the population with sanitation services by 2021 and to bring 221 landfills in line with the sanitary and environmental requirements. The Ministry of Construction and the State Committee for Ecology and Environmental Protection have been instructed to put construction waste landfills and recycling facilities into operation this year in the Tashkent, Samarkand and Andijan regions. Proposals were made to expand the area of protected lands and increase responsibility for trapping and relocating endangered species. Illegal logging is a present major problem despite the moratorium declared by the president. The Prosecutor General's office was also instructed to provide strict supervision of mayors on these activities. The president also gave instructions to encourage industrial enterprises to use environmental technologies. As of March 7th, no signs of infection have been found in the roughly 50 Uzbek citizens currently in Iran, the Foreign Ministry reports. A task force operating out of the Uzbek embassy in Tehran has been working round the clock since March 1st to track the spread of COVID-19 and will be in place until the situation is stabilized. Citizens of Uzbekistan were asked to adhere to the rules and regulation of the Iranian government and sanitation measures. The embassy also requested the citizens consider returning to Uzbekistan, keeping in mind that once they arrive, they will be placed in a 14-day quarantine. In the meantime, as on Saturday, the death toll in Iran from the coronavirus has surpassed 120. 1,234 new cases were reported across the country in the last day. Beside Italy and South Korea, Iran is the worst affected country since the outbreak of the disease in China last December. As part of its efforts to contain the virus, Tehran has taken several measures, including the closure of all schools and institutes of higher education, calling off sports events nationwide, as well as banning government officials from leaving the country. The global death toll has crossed 3,300, with more than 97,000 confirmed cases in 87 countries, according to the World Health Organization. Saudi Arabia's Aqua Power has signed three deals with the Uzbek government for a total of $2 billion. These include a 25-year, $1.2 billion power purchasing agreement and a project to build a gas-fired plant in the Serdaria region. The agreement includes a contract for the construction and operation of a one and a half gigawatt gas turbine power plant. This will not only reduce the consumption of natural gas by more than half, but also make up for the existing shortage of electricity. 
ensuring a more stable supply to the population and industries. Today we have signed not only an agreement on the construction of a thermal power plant, but also an agreement on the construction of wind farms, that is, in the field of renewable energy sources. This area is now actively developing. We want to increase the share of renewable energy sources to 30% by 2030. The third agreement, an MOU signed by the Ministry of Energy, Aquapower and Air Products, provides for technical training of specialists in the energy and chemical sectors at local colleges. It is a great honor for us to be able to use our many years of experience to reveal the huge potential of the energy sector in Uzbekistan. Our partnership will create new opportunities for national and social development and help build a sustainable future for all the people of this great country. The agreement signifies Uzbekistan's growing role in the global energy market, as well as its commitment to energy security and implementation of current technologies. It is a clear indication that Uzbekistan is fast becoming an attractive opportunity for foreign investors. An event in Tashkent has given a start to the implementation of five new projects funded by the European Union in Uzbekistan to promote democracy, human rights and civil society. Project executives and partners learned about the main requirements for financing and contracting, as well as shared their experiences working in the field. We are really lucky. Since the EU has supported our project, the project aims at creating conditions for victims of violence. In the past two years, we have completed the first stage of our pilot project. With the help of the project, we have helped many women, and the project has achieved certain results. Moreover, the EU is intended to support our second project as well. Officials of ministries and departments in the framework of the event briefed about reforms in the legislation as well as financing of the activities of NGOs by the state. The Minister of Justice has also developed proposals. Starting next year, we are going to set the amount of funds for working with NGOs. Of course, there are challenges. But what is important, the Parliament, the Minister of Justice and international partners are ready to cooperate. Participants of the event were unanimous in their opinion that the civil society itself is the basis for social progress and sustainable economic growth. An intensive process of government reform can only be successful if people can shape the public policy. Tenge Bank is planning to increase market share in Uzbekistan by lending to small and medium-sized businesses. In a telephone interview with Reuters, bank CEO Aslan Talpaki said it aims to take 19th place in the country in terms of assets by the end of 2020. This is despite the risks of high inflation and pressure on the local currency. However, Talpaki noted that the government of Uzbekistan and the central bank are working to implement measures that will see a decrease in inflation and the cost of funding and lending will become more affordable for both individuals and larger official bodies. First Deputy Chairman of the Senate, Sadiq Safayev, has met with Vion CEO Khan Terzioglu and the group's advisor Boris Tadic. The parties discussed opportunities in the telecoms in the move for a digital economy and e-government. The meeting saw an exchange of views on the application of laws in the telecommunications networks of Uzbekistan, as well as the liberalization of the country's legislative acts on taxes. The development of free entrepreneurship and the government's focus on creating a legal framework in support of the Year of Science, Education and the Digital Economy initiative were also discussed. And these countries include uh, one of the most highly growing countries around the world, including uh, Uzbekistan. And we have been active in Uzbekistan since 2006. And uh, practically during this time, we have seen the progress that has been made in Uzbekistan really remarkable in terms of adapting technology. I think it is no surprise that Uzbekistan has announced this year as the year of digitalization. And I think it is exactly the right time that we double down on our investments in making sure that Uzbekistan has world-class networks, both mobile and fixed and basically becomes a leader in the region, especially contributing to one road, one belt policy. And I think we are here practically to make sure that uh, we can express the value that we can bring to the country and develop partnerships, both for local governments and central government, to digitize citizen services. And Uzbekistan is a very critical country in the region. And I believe every action that we will do here will become also an exemplary case for other countries. The Veyon Group stated that it will continue its involvement in the investment projects aimed at improving the organizational and institutional foundations of the digital economy and the e-government of Uzbekistan, while developing telecommunications infrastructure, modernizing mobile communication networks and other telecommunications services in Uzbekistan is also a top priority. We are continuing to recommend that all countries make containment their highest priority. 
As the number of confirmed coronavirus cases globally continues to rise, the World Health Organization on Friday urged governments around the world to unleash their full power to contain the outbreak of COVID-19. We continue to call on countries to find, test, isolate and care for every case and to trace every contact. The United Nations agency stressed that fighting the epidemic requires countries to work together. This as the number of cases worldwide topped 100,000 according to a Reuters tally. Amid signs that countries are struggling to get the outbreak under control. Death tolls have passed 3,400, most of those in China where the outbreak began. But the epidemic is now spreading faster elsewhere. In the U.S., the outbreak has now killed 15 people and it continues to spread. On Friday, six states reported their first cases, bringing the total number of states with confirmed cases to 25. The rise comes as the Trump administration is facing widespread scrutiny over a lack of tests available for those in need. Contradicting his officials, Trump said the government had the capacity to test everyone. I think it was enough to test 75,000 people into the public health lab now. Anybody that wants a test can get a test. That's and what I, I would just say. That Meanwhile, Vice President Mike Pence, who the president appointed to lead the U.S. government's response to the outbreak, said people aboard a cruise ship off the coast of San Francisco have tested positive for coronavirus. 21 individuals on the Grand Princess tested positive. Among those were 19 crew members and two passengers. Pence said the cruise liner will be brought to an unspecified non-commercial port where 3,500 people, including passengers and crew, will be tested. Earlier in the day, President Trump speaking about the cruise ship said he preferred they stay on the ship. So I want to bring all those people on. People would like me to do that. I don't like the idea of doing it. The steady spread of the virus has started to disrupt daily life for many Americans. In Seattle, the epicenter of the nation's outbreak, there were school closures and people ordered to work from home. And fearing concerns about the potential spread of COVID-19, South by Southwest, the music and tech festival in Austin, Texas, has been canceled. Global stocks toppled once again Friday as the number of coronavirus infections topped 100,000 worldwide. Adding to fears, any economic fallout will get worse. Markets ended well above the lows of the day. The Dow lost 256 points. The S&P 500 shed 51. The Nasdaq was down 162. Despite some staggering falls this week, stocks actually had an up week. But that doesn't mean investors aren't still afraid of the economic damage being caused by the coronavirus outbreak. Paul Kleinschmidt is a portfolio manager at Tocqueville Asset Management. The coronavirus fears are fears that are both expressing uncertainty in supply and in demand, which is unusual. Usually it's one of the two. But between supply chains and between what's happening in major cities, I think people are having a very difficult time discounting what the future is going to look like. And in another sign, Wall Street is fixated on the possibility the coronavirus outbreak could lead to an economic recession. Investors flocked to the perceived safety of gold and U.S. government debt. Yields on the benchmark 10-year note touched another new low, this time breaking below 0.7 percent for the first time ever. Worries about the economic damage being caused by the coronavirus eclipsed a report showing robust hiring in the U.S. Employers created 273,000 new jobs in February and the unemployment rate fell back down to a near 50-year low of three and a half percent. But the statistics were compiled before the coronavirus began to spread in the U.S. in late February, which could change the employment picture going forward. For example, United Airlines and JetBlue recently announced hiring freezes. Airlines are seeing a drop in bookings and a jump in cancellations, with the coronavirus outbreak causing some travelers to stay home. Oil prices had their biggest percentage drop since the financial crisis as OPEC and Russia 
failed to reach an agreement to cut production. Amsterdam is sailing into the future. The city known for its progressive nature is making its waterways sustainable. As diesel-powered canal boats will be banned from 2025, the port of Amsterdam has introduced a floating charging station. It will power those vessels as part of the Dutch city's energy makeover. The city promises to have 100 charging stations installed by the end of 2021. City officials say the transition to electric power is well underway, with 75% of commercial vessels already qualifying as emissions-free. But that number falls to 5% when you look at privately owned boats. And it doesn't come cheap. Converting some canal boats to electric can cost up to €40,000 depending on the size. With around 4 million passengers sailing on Amsterdam's canals every year, the city has its work cut out to make its waters green. These have been the latest stories on Uzi Report World News with me, Sedrasul Ashrafhanov. Until next time, goodbye.